What's the worst business advice you've ever received? Today, we're talking bad business advice. This is the Kawartha Small Business Podcast, and we've got business conversations for the Kawartha commute. I'm Brian Rump. And I'm Matt Garrity from Maddie G Digital. All right, Maddie. Uh, this episode is sponsored by Starting Point Digital Marketing. You know you should be doing digital marketing, but you never seem to have the time to do it right. Your business deserves to have good digital marketing that's quick, easy, and inexpensive. Starting Point Digital Marketing provides intentionally simple marketing designed just for you. Head over to startingpointdigitalmarketing.ca to get started. All right, Matt, what's the worst business advice or or just a good example of some bad business advice that maybe you've received or given? Yeah, probably the worst business advice I've ever received is uh, that starting a podcast is great for marketing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. I don't know what the worst business advice I've ever received is. I don't know if I can single it out. I feel like maybe myself, and I don't know if this is true to other business owners as I'm like racking my brain here, is I wonder if we tune out what we perceive to be bad business advice. And bad business advice is things that we haven't really followed and paths that we haven't gone down. And in certain ways, I don't want to sound like a doofus, but like I try not to think back on things that I've moved past, try not to think backwards, trying to think forward. Oh, that sounds so dumb when I say that out loud. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's funny. Does that make sense? That's it. Yeah, it's an interesting point about, you know, moving beyond it, sort of filtering it out. Um, I think my perspective's a little bit different. I, you know, when I wanted to do this topic and I have a very long list of sort of bad advice, it's it's not necessarily advice I've been given. It's advice that I see people take um, or that I've seen, um, you know, people try to give. Um, I've worked with hundreds of small businesses, uh, you know, previously in banking and then in grants. And when you meet a lot of businesses and you get into their financials, you hear things about who maybe some of their mentors or influences are. And so many people have a spin when they're giving advice. Um, and it's not always good for the business. Right. It might be good for what they did 30 years ago. Um, but it, you know, there's just so many examples of ones that uh, just aren't good for that business or they don't lead to good long term um, outcomes. Right. Absolutely. And the more I think about the original question of what's the worst business advice that you've gotten, and I think back, and again, I cannot tell you a definitive one, but I now look back on many countless situations where I thought a business owner or a manager was telling me something at the time I thought was absolutely ridiculous and was the absolute wrong way to do things. Now, there are certain situations where I know for a fact that I thought they were stupid when they were told to me that I now see and understand to be true. And I was wrong at the time. And it's all about perspective and maybe some empathy and just better understanding where they were in their situation, um, what was right for them at the time. There's so much going on behind the scenes that you don't understand finances and organizational things and all those type of things that at the time as an employee, you, you're like, this doesn't make any sense. This is stupid. I can do this better. Yeah. But now I, look back and I was like, I know for a fact, there's a couple of things that I am doing literally right now that I used to think was absolutely ludicrous a couple of years ago. And I, yeah. I won't even go into it, but there are, now I look back and I... That's a whole other podcast. Yeah. Um, I, I understand like, where they were coming from. And yeah. like every business I've ever worked for. 
So there's always those situations as an employee where you're like, oh, I could do it better or this doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, but it's all about the circumstances and the situation that you're put in. And bad business advice is maybe circumstantial. <laughs> yeah, I think it's um, you know, a couple things. Circumstantial could be bad business advice. I think it can also come from not having a proper plan or strategy or vision for your business. Um, and it also um, comes from people who are using their own biases. Um, and sometimes you have to check those biases or that baggage. Um, or sometimes it's bad business advice because um, people want you to achieve your goal or, you know, they want, you to achieve the goals that they've set for themselves and they say, oh man, you could sort of achieve that. Whereas maybe you don't even want to achieve that. So it just gets muddy and ends up being bad advice for that business. Right. And so much of his opinion, like you just mentioned too, like there might, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, budding entrepreneurs. I do talks with various groups to young people and I try to mentor a lot of these entrepreneurs and I like to say almost out of the gate that this is just my advice this is my opinion I don't like to say my opinion because I feel like if I'm saying something that should be given that it's my opinion <laughs> yeah but I often say like this might not be right period <laughs> It might not right be right for me in the future, but I'm telling you this now because this is what I currently believe. These are some of my beliefs and values and things. Um, they might not be right for you. You can take it from it what you want. Maybe something will stick. I've been speaking to uh, someone for over a year and a half, mentoring them and trying to push them. And nothing was really coming of it for a lot of different reasons. And just a week ago, she said I said something. And I wasn't even thinking very deeply about it. And she said something. I said something. And it completely clicked with her. And it changed everything and the direction she was going and progress. And she's so excited about now starting her own business. And I love that. That's awesome. And I was like, I didn't even. It wasn't even profound. I don't think it was profound at all. Oh, the profound stuff, you can't choose what pe what sticks. I've learned that in teaching. People will be like, oh, you know, you said this in class and it really stuck with me. And I'm like, I, I don't even remember saying that. And how come you didn't pick up on all my other carefully crafted, witty, <laughs> profound <laughs> statements? Like, no, everyone just stares blankly at those, but then something else just clicks. Yeah, I, I asked her after the conversation I had with her on the phone yesterday. I said, I've, every time I spoke to you, you never seemed excited about starting your own business. You, you kind of came from it from a point of hating being employed. And there was always like anger there. And it never sounded like, seemed like excitement, right? But yesterday she was excited for the first time ever. And yeah, she was like, oh, last week you asked me, would I ever think about hiring someone? And all of a sudden, it all just came together in her mind how she would start this business and run it. And I just awesome. thought that was something really cool. So, Oh, that's uh, kind of neat um, for that stuff. So um, back to some bad advice. Yeah. I've, I've, I've got some axes. I've got some axes to grind here. <laughs> So we're going to, yeah. we are going to get, we're going to get some hate mail. Um, Cause uh, just, you know, in terms of my perspective and some things that I've seen, there's some common ones that uh, just sort of uh, just make me angry. Uh, number one star is the buy your building advice. Hey, you should own real estate. You should really buy your building stop paying rent. That's such a waste. And this is some of the worst advice for small businesses uh, because usually it's given to people who can't afford to be real estate investors or landlords. Um, it's given to people before their business is really taken off. They might not even be paying themselves enough yet. And they're like, oh man, my rent's expensive. So you know what I should do? I should 
go find a hundred percent financing or pull together any money I can to buy my building because that will make it better. Um, and it doesn't make it better. Um, you just end up being a highly, highly leveraged real estate investor. And then your business is handcuffed by the building that you're in. Um, my favorite example of this is from a Lindsay chamber of commerce talk and, uh, Bjorn who owns, um, the uh, furniture place, which I'm drawing a blank on at Lindsay, talked about years ago when he was getting um, started, how the best thing he ever did was not buy his building. Because if he bought his building, he wouldn't have moved three or four times to progressively bigger and bigger places. Right. Um, so that's sort of one example. But where I see it a lot is people who don't have enough cash to really be buying their building. And then all of a sudden now they own a building, the roof starts leaking and they're straining their business. They can't hire more people. They can't add, do marketing for their business because this building has become a big anchor on them. Um, and it's all because of, you know, sort of feeding into this parad sort of, um, paradigm that you must own real estate to be a valid person. And I think the biggest misconception, and maybe I'm wrong, but in my head, something just clicked when we were having this conversation. When we buy property personally, we can flip it. Not like flipping it on TV in a couple of weeks and like making a fortune, but we can sell it again relatively easy. Let's say personal property, a home, it's going to sell 30, 60, 90 days. Commercial property, not everybody wants commercial property. It's not something that you could just quickly flip. I don't know how long it would take, but I don't think it's something very smooth where everyone's falling all over each other to get into commercial property. Uh, typically it isn't. Now we're going through a period right now where um, Canada is a haven for international money laundering. And that has created real estate bubbles, which is one reason why we can easily sell homes and prices have been going up. Now, uh, I remember in the late 80s, early 90s, when there was the last sort of bubble burst in real estate and my parents trying to sell our house that took like two years to sell. Oh, wow. Uh, so that could happen again. Um, when I was early in my banking career, I had a, a real estate building owner who was selling his building. And I remember them saying like, it's just a calculation. It's based on the rent you can get. And that's how you determine the value of it. And in a normal market, a real estate investor would buy it based on sort of the calculation of what it gets in rent, what they think they could increase the rent to with some building improvements um, now I think in some ways, if there is a bubble that bursts, it's a worse investment because we're seeing people buy buildings for way more than like the rent could possibly sort of cover. Um, and they're already sort of cash negative out of the gate, which again, makes it even a worse decision, you know, to, if you're renting a spot to buy the building that you're in. Um, I've seen where people have pay, say, $1,000 a month rent, which is really low. But then to buy the building, their mortgage and all the costs would be like $2,000 a month. So, you know, their business now has to absorb way more um, expense that's just going to hurt you and hold you back from sort of natural growth and expansion. Very interesting. Uh, before we get too much down the rabbit hole of financial, commercial, real estate investment, what's some other? That's a whole other topic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's we're stopping it from there. If you want to know more, set it up at Core the Small Business Podcast. Ca. Uh, we could fight uh, mortgage brokers. Need not send any trolley advice because uh, you're dining out on money laundering right now. Um, so. <laughs> That's uh, not cool. Uh, sort of another uh, um, 
you know, bad piece of advice um, is, you know, related to finance again is borrowing money for operations. I hate seeing it. You know, businesses are struggling. They got to pay their bills, their rent, their payroll. And someone's like, oh, I'll get a line of credit. Um, Line of credits for a small business, to be honest, you probably don't need one. Um, Unless you're carrying a lot of inventory, unless you're doing a lot of work for people that you don't get paid for until that work is over, you probably don't actually need that. You're just borrowing because you've run out of money and your business is not um, sustainable. And what you really need is um, maybe a bit of a wake up call, a bit of clarity over why that's happening. Um, If you're just starting your business and, you know, things are a bit slower, uh, then that might be part of your plan. Uh, But one of the things I wrote down, it might be a fun quote is um, we need to always be intentional with losing money Um, and just going to borrow to make ends meet is not usually intentional. And it just leads to a slippery slope where, you know, you're up and down, you're borrowing a bit. And I've seen it hundreds of times where it just adds up and adds up and then never gets paid off. That's very interesting. Probably goes back to your whole profit first methodology with business owners and cash flow. Yeah. And I think profit first is a solution to that, um, which is, um, you know, if you don't have the money, um, your business is screaming at you. So the answer isn't, you know, go borrow. And there are programs sometimes, and there's typically it's bankers could be crown borrowing agencies, um, government, um, type people where they, they sort of put the loan out as a solution and it's not, um, loans are good, in the right circumstances, they can help you sort of leverage to make more money. Again, there should always be a link between I'm borrowing as leverage to what my direct growth is. Um, if it's a band-aid solution, um, then there's usually a deeper problem at the root and we need to address that um, before we start borrowing. Very interesting. Uh, one that I've been thinking of throughout this conversation now from a marketing perspective, but I get often, I kind of got that today in an email. The person was asking me for some legitimate advice and in introducing himself. Um, but the question ultimately was, do I need to do marketing or can I build my business through networking? And my honest opinion... Networking is marketing. Well, yeah, like that one thing. And long story short here is... You can build a business through networking, referrals, word of mouth, but that's only one channel of getting business. You can also get business through marketing. So ads, email, search engines, social media, et cetera. There's also ways to market businesses specifically that get all their business through word of mouth. So yeah. me and you are having a conversation and you recommend that I go reach out to a company. I'm not immediately calling that company. There's a 0% chance that that happens. After I get oh, yeah. a nation from you, I'm hopping online. I'm Googling them. Hopefully my website comes up first. So that's a search engine issue. When I click on the website, hopefully the website looks somewhat good and that's subjective. So you need to make sure you have a decent website that provides people good information or at a minimum, how to get a hold of you. And then yep. once they read your website, they're off to your social media because, okay, they've read everything. They've got all the information they need from the website. Now they want to check out a bit more. And how do they have more of a conversation with you? They now move over to social and they see what's going on there. Do you have a Facebook? Do you have an Instagram? Why aren't you on those platforms? I will challenge every single person that listens to this that wants to tell me that my business doesn't need Instagram because I will shut that down and I will explain it to you in lovely. (laughs) 
Every business needs it. Um, but you need to, especially in this past year throughout COVID pandemic, it used to be with social media. Uh, are you relevant? Are you still around? Are you in business? Now it's like, oh, shoot, did these guys make it through COVID? And, oh, yeah, that's a really good point. Are they still alive? And it used to be like that before COVID. When you would hop on at the beginning of 2020, say March, and then you're looking, these guys haven't posted since 2018, or they posted like yeah. six months ago. You're already questioning if they're around. If you've gone throughout this whole year without posting anything on social, your potential customer doesn't even think that you exist anymore. They think that you made, you didn't make it through all the hardships that we had 2020. So uh, that's probably the biggest one from a marketing perspective that I get. It, yeah, that's... Awesome. I had to hear terrible marketing, which is, um, I think falls under that because being not consistent is terrible. And I love your point about, you know, oh, they haven't posted in three years. It's a pet peeve of mine. And then I've realized I've been that guy and I hate it so much where, yeah, you log on and it's like, oh, they had six Instagram posts two years ago, all within two days. So it's like they got on a roll and then they did it and then they forgot, right? And I look at it as, yeah, are they active? Do they want my business? Do they present as professional? And everybody should be doing that. Yeah, I think all those comments are fair, especially when you're looking at social media. It's not this entirely fun free for all where we're displaying every moment of our life. There is so many opportunities from a business perspective there that people dismiss for personal bias, to be completely honest with you. All right. Awesome. Are you ready for me to grind another ax? Keep going. <laughs> all right. So this next one is uh, one that I, I will never, ever understand, which is don't make any money. And then you don't have to pay any taxes. Um, no, you so this have is that, have you? I haven't said it, but all sorts of people will do whatever they can to, they don't want to pay taxes at all. So they'll either commit fraud, which is a subject for another time, um, or they'll like not take on work. I've, I've seen people do that. Um, or they'll spend too much money to pay taxes. That's a sort of same category. That's the, well, you don't want to pay taxes. So you made some money, you better rush out and spend it. And we see that as a banker, I would see that every December, the end of the year, people would be, for whatever reason, they would do their, a quick calculation and then they'd say, oh, I need to you know, go spend $50,000 so that I don't have to pay tax. And right. I'm all for spending if it's an investment that's going to make you more money. But otherwise, you're just throwing wealth away. And that money could be like just better used um, for your own self and building your own wealth. Right. Very interesting. So, yeah, that's a bad one as well. I'm going to rifle through a few here. Some quick hits. Another one. Pardon? Some quick hits. Quick hits. Another one is overcomplicated business structures. This is another one that oh. it, it, certain accountants will do it. Some lawyers. I'll meet with like a, a startup who's never like um, earned a dollar yet. And they've spent like $5,000 to like draw up different corporate documents and it's great, but there's just so many more simple ways to start and adjust as you go than to just in overcomplicate things from the start um, because you don't know how things are going to go yet. Um, and then even then when you have a business, lots of people I think love to pretend they're a more savvy business owner than they are. And they just end up with a lot of redundancies. Um, I had a boss once who thought he was the king entrepreneur because he owned like eight companies. Um, and really two of them were operating and the rest was just a complicated way to structure things. And it wasn't really necessary. Um, you know, unless you're a multimillionaire, 
or have a lot of money that you're trying to redistribute and hide. It, it's, you know, if you're a small business, don't go too complicated. Yeah. And I think that's something that comes up a lot with maybe all business owners, entrepreneurs for sure when they're starting out. And this is something, a piece of advice that I've been giving to people is before you get too much in the weeds with what you perceive to be the perfect plan and the perfect process and the perfect organization, you just need to make money and then worry about everything else afterwards. Uh, I've got a friend that found himself in a situation where he was out on his own, doing his own thing, never really perceived him to be a business owner on his own. Um, fantastic at what he did and his what he does and his skills. I didn't know if he really wanted to be a, a business owner completely out there on his own. And we have conversations all the time and he's like just panicking, which is fair because he really wasn't planning this a year ago. Uh, and he's asking me about accounting and bookkeeping and taxes and process and HR and Ta-da, 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 all the things that they teach you in business school or whatever. And he doesn't really really understand that his biggest concern right now is like he just needs money. He needs to like get money so he can put food on the table to feed his family. And fortunately, he's hit the ground. I wouldn't even say running. I'd say he's hit the ground running downhill because he is just on fire right now. He's so successful. He's making a ton of money. He told me he's making he's made as much money in his handful of months that he's been doing this on his own than he did the entire previous year that he was employed. And I wow. tell him, like, dude, don't worry about anything else right now. Worry yeah. about tax, tax time. Worry about bookkeeping and accounting when it comes up. You don't need to worry about a lot of these little things right now. There's a couple of things yeah. to tell him about them. Make sure you're taking some of that money that you're making and putting aside come tax time. Here's a number yeah. for you, but everything else, don't worry about it. Like don't worry about a pro yeah. don't worry about hiring and all these things. Like just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. You could figure that out. Um, yeah. Which is, that's some good advice that you're giving. Thank you. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm going to rattle some cages here. We're getting near the end of our Kawartha commute. We may not get everything in, but uh, just because we're on a good, everybody is going to hate Brian from this episode. Um, friends and family discounts, they should not exist. So when people are advising you, just in general, if, especially if you're new to do discounting, I think that's usually bad advice. There's maybe some times where that you know makes sense or proper promotions. But just in general, um, I never recommend people do discounting. And then I definitely don't recommend friends and family because your friends and family as a small business should be the ones lined up at the door and the first people in line to support you, not expect you to give them stuff for free. Yeah, absolutely. I'm like a huge supporter in not discounting anything. I do. I've been pretty fortunate on my own. I have not had too many people ask for a discount, uh, not directly at least. Uh, and I, I especially don't really mess with that within any time this year. That was also a promise to myself. Uh, I used to compromise on price a lot where uh, here's what the outline or the scope of work would be. And then the client prospect would say something along the lines like well i only have like a fraction of that so i would like then try to redo my plan but i've kind of gotten away from that Um, i'm i don't support i don't encourage discounting i had a situation recently where i reached out to someone and they just out of the blue offered me a discount and maybe i'm patting myself on the back and i shouldn't even tell this story but i just turned around i was like i don't want the discount i I, i'm here to support you i paid full price for it like there's there's no real reason to give me the discount man Uh, maybe it makes more sense big ticket items where there's massive markup but retailers specifically no there's no way 
that they should be offering friends and family discounts. It's, there's, it's just, it's not beneficial to anyone. Yeah, no, I think that's good. And it's good to, um, yeah, it's a, again, another conversation for another time. Um, I almost was going to bite really hard on the, you know, higher markup items in some cases and those don't really exist. They just feel like they do, but there's usually other costs people don't forget about, you know, again, you could change the scope of work. You can help people do things to save money, but in terms of just the outright, Oh, I'm going to shave, you know, 30% off because you're a friend or family is not, um, Good, and we could walk through the math on that later as to just how much that can uh, yeah hurt you sometimes. I've had it happen a so. couple times actually this year where people have said or suggested that what's the term I sharpen my pencil because oh yeah because I've had a really hard time with COVID is what they've said, and I just yeah I don't say anything but in my mind I'm like yeah me too. Like, because you did well and my uh i'm not you but it's like yeah maybe you should have done you some marketing earlier then <laughs> like you know you've had an extra hard time because you had no way to tell people how your business changed and how to do business with you now and you weren't ready to pivot and all of these marketing things and that just shows why you need it right yeah and like my costs haven't changed my requirements and needs and value have not changed because of COVID specifically. And I'm sorry, but it's not my responsibility to make it cheaper for you because you cannot afford it or you can't you yeah. can see the value or you're not ready to make that jump. So I think if I can recall, I've not worked with any of those people because I, I'm pretty bad at immediately um, just – not caring when I hear certain things, I check out. Like as soon as I hear that, and it's happened two or three times, I've just immediately checked out of that relationship. So, <laughs> yeah, well, that's awesome, and that uh, sounds like an episode to me. We're at the end of our Kawartha commute. Uh, we'll maybe have to do another one on this. If you have some uh, compliments for us ideas for the show, you'd like to be on the show, you'd like to discuss some bad business advice, uh, you can email us at setitup at Kawartha Small Business Podcast.ca.